What's the work of culture for car calling our attention to moments of crisis? Latoya Ruby Fraser's interventions give us a sense of what it takes. It also takes courage when our laws fail. It takes the courage that's exemplified in the work of our next two speakers, Chelsea Clinton, who's vice chair of the Clinton Foundation, working extremely hard to drive programmatic objectives that have as their greater goal to create opportunities for people to build a better future for themselves and their families and their communities. The Vision and Justice Project so was animated by a charge that Chelsea Clinton gave me to ensure that the work did not simply go out to those who understand and believe in the power of culture for greater racial equity, but for those who don't. And so I very much thank her for that charge and for the work that she does. Her conversations with our next speaker inspired this intervention in our convening and doctor, that is Dr. Mona Hanna Echeta. She's a pediatrician, professor, and public health advocate who spearheaded efforts to reveal and to publicize and to fix the water crisis in Flint. This occurred, of course, in 2014, and because we're short on time, I'm just going to fast forward to what you know took place, which is that she understood that the only way to stop the lead poisoning would be to prevent undeniable proof on a national platform that this was taking place. It took courage. She revealed her team's findings. She revealed the findings before they were actually peer reviewed, which we know in academia is a risk. But she did so to prioritize the health of the community over the risk to her own career. This resulted in brutal backlash, but the resistance paid off and the city switched the water back to its original source and President Obama declared a federal emergency. She has since been called to testify twice before the US Congress and has received the Freedom of Expression Courage Award by Pan America and was named by Time Magazine one of the 100 most influential people in the world, which uh, seems an appropriate accolade, but almost a, one incommensurate to the extraordinary work that you have done. So I now invite you to welcome them to the stage. Chelsea Clinton. Well, thank you, Sarah, for that generous introduction. Uh, I think I have to uh, just own that I have known and loved Sarah for almost two decades. So it is such an honor and a privilege uh, to be here and to be part of something that she has created. Um, it is also always an honor and a privilege to be here with Dr. Mona, one of my all-time heroes. And I think uh, in Sarah's introduction, it's probably evident why I feel that way so strongly. And after our conversation today, I hope that there will uh, be even more fans in the Dr. Mona Club. Um, you know, uh, you know Winton said earlier that uh, part of his mission is to help make the invisible visible, and he does that in art. We just saw so beautifully uh, how uh, Latoya Ruby Fraser does that through photography, including in Flint. And Dr. Mona, you do that through data and storytelling. And one of the real pernicious challenges of lead is that it is invisible to the naked eye, it is odorless, it is tasteless. And so you had to marshal uh, data and stories to be able to help raise this urgent cry. You know, we sit here just right after the ignominious five-year anniversary of when Flint switched water sources from the Great Lakes to the Flint River and yet it would take another year and a half um, before you were finally listened to. Could you talk a little bit about um, why and how you decided to use data to help kind of puncture through the denialism and the obstruction? Yeah, so 
Um, like Chelsea meant mentioned, yesterday was our five-year anniversary of our water switch. So April 2014 is when that fateful decision was made where a, a, a button was pushed and we started drawing our water from the Flint River um, after really getting our water for half a century from the Great Lakes. Michigan is literally surrounded by the largest source of fresh water in the world. Um, and for about a year and a half, the people of Flint were heroic and they were brave and they were loud and they knew something was wrong. It was brownish and greenish. Do you guys remember those pictures? It was brownish and greenish and it smelled weird and tasted weird and there was bacteria issues. And the list goes on of what was happening with this water. And the crisis really never should have started. It was man-made choices that created this drug crisis. Just like LaToya said, it was driven by um, lost democracy, driven by stolen opportunity, driven by austerity and racism, by neglect, by a population that we choose not to see. Um, and it, it never should have started. It should have ended when that first mom raised a jug of brown water. It should have ended when we actually had the science that there was lead in the water. My work never should have happened. You never needed to have a pediatrician come in and use science to prove that our children were being poisoned. That, that's, that never, ever, ever should have happened. But I knew after kind of a year and a half of denials and, and the dismissive nature of what was happening, that if I was going to make any impact in the story, if I was going to truly fight for my children, which as a pediatrician I have taken an oath to do, um, that I would need the data in my pocket. Um, and not just data, um, it was also very much driven by storytelling. So this press conference that we had, which was a total academic no-no of releasing research before it was peer-reviewed, um, it was totally disobedient, but it had to be done because that peer review process, like any academic knows, takes a long time. Um, so we released that research, and, and my presentation was not just graphs and PowerPoints and science and facts, but it was also stories, and it was a story about a child, and I held up a water bottle. So I leaned on kind of my history as a former drama student on, on how, to, how to best share, um, share those stories and, and really wake the nation up to this literally most emblematic environmental and public health disaster of the century. And yet, not everyone wanted to hear what you had to say. And in fact, there were active efforts to discredit you and disparage you, to minimize even your kind of robust uh, data that showed that lead levels had exploded in kids uh, across the county um, from before the water switch to afterward. Um, and since you know, Sarah mentioned your courage and your persistence, can you just talk about how you continue to help build that case and continue to muster the evidence and the stories that you knew were necessary because every day that this was happening was another day where kids' brains were literally being damaged. Absolutely, and, and the story is, is not about a person. It, uh, the reason that I'm so excited to share the story is because it's about a team. It's about an unexpected team that came together. So, you know, yes, you all know that the story of Flint is a story of a crime, like an absolute crime committed against some of the most vulnerable people in this country, people that we choose not to see. But it is also this incredible story of people just like you and I that came together, moms and activists and journalists and scientists and students and doctors and, and stood up and said, we're not happy with the status quo. We're not accepting what you're telling us, and stood up and came together um, and demanded action for our children. Um, so that is how kind of the story exploded and came to light um, and how we were able to persist. So it was through teamwork, it was through science, it was through persistence that, that evidently spoke truth to power and got, you know, exposed this man-made crisis. And you know, something that you mentioned earlier, Dr. Mona, that you and I have talked a lot about um, that is embedded in the title of your book, you know, what the eyes don't see. You know, it's not only what the eyes don't see in terms of the lead in the water, it's also what too often, you know, are, are the people who are not seen and not listened to and who have been purposefully and consistently disenfranchised. Um, and I think one of the things that I know we find so troubling is that when the water crisis struck Flint, um, about 50% of the black population of Michigan was living under emergency management, meaning they were not living under uh, elected officials of their own choosing. They were living under kind of effectively rule by the state. And only 2% of white Michigan was living under emergency management. Can you talk about kind of how you just have seen as a pediatrician and as a public health advocate and activist, 
kind of that loss of democracy yeah. uh, and enfranchisement in action. Because we spend a lot of time, I think now publicly, understandably focused on voter disenfranchisement before people get to vote. But I think it's also important to realize that sometimes we disenfranchise people after they've actually voted, yeah. including uh, in Michigan to a really large extent. Yeah, so, you know, the story of Flint has so many kind of national relevant uh, relationships. So it's, it's, it's not just this isolated story about this one crazy city that changed its water source and poisons people, um, but it is a story of really kind of the deeper crises that are facing our nation right now. Um, and we'll get to that democracy piece, but it's also a story of what happens when we disrespect science. And that you turn on your news today and, and we are actively denying the science of climate change and vaccines. It's a story of environmental injustices that continue, where people who are poor and minority continue um, to be burdened disproportionately by environmental contamination. Um, it's a story really on the assault of the promise of our children. Um, it's a story of what happens when we break, you know, don't invest in our infrastructure. But, but so much of the story of Flint is also a story of what happens when democracy is broken down and taken away from our most vulnerable populations. The city of Flint was under financial emergency management. An emergency manager came in, they just reported to the governor the role of our elected officials, our mayor and city council was literally taken away, usurped overnight. Um, and that emergency manager had one job and that job was austerity. It was to save money, really, at no matter what the cost. Um, and, you know, not driven by accountability, not driven by justice, not driven by public health. Um, it was all about what, you know, what will balance the books. And this was our former governor whose mantra was that we should run government like a business. And that doesn't work for, for things like water and children. Well, and I think one of the most painful kind of illustrative anecdotes is that it would have cost about $100 a day to add the anti-corrosive treatment uh, to the water coming from the Flint River, and that would have prevented the lead from leaching out of the pipes. So it was not worth $100 a day to the emergency manager and his team to be able to protect the children and the families of Flint. You know, the, the story is so much portrayed as a story of austerity and cost, cunt, cost cutting, and then we realize that you know, it would have cost hardly nothing to treat this water properly. So that treatment chemical wasn't added, the pump to install that treatment chemical wasn't added, um, and now in the kind of uh, released emails, we hear you know, this back and forth, somebody at the EPA said that Flint wasn't a city worth going out on a limb for. Um, when the state was finally asked by the EPA to treat the water properly, the, the state drinking water official said, but who's drinking this water anyways? Um, so the, the neglect and the indifference and the blindness to this population was clearly evident, and that is why repeatedly investigations, um, the race and demographics of the population have been highlighted. This never would have happened in a richer or a wider city. This was a population that we chose not to see and, and not to care for. It never would have happened in Ann Arbor. No. Um, you know, one of the other, I think, really illuminating parts of your storytelling work is linking what has happened in Flint in recent history to kind of the industrial history of Flint and particularly to General Motors, which I know is a kind of contextually complex story for you to share because your dad worked at General Motors and you say that's really what enabled him to give your family the American dream. Everybody in Michigan has an auto industry connection like one or two degrees away. <laughs> um, and yet you still kind of with such a clear eyed uh, perspective, kind of detail, um, how this story is inextricably linked to General Motors, and it's not just kind of the disinvestment over the last few decades. Um, it's actually kind of the original decisions by General Motors in the 1920s to add kind of lead derivatives to engines to help prevent the knocking sound from being too loud, because clearly kind of the comfort of our ears is more important than the safety of our children's brains or to kind of add lead to gasoline, even though already in the 1920s, General Motors knew that these were poisonous. They may not have been yet able to classify them as neurotoxins, but they knew they were poisonous. Could you talk a little bit about that and kind of 
why it was so important to you to include that history in your book and, and your continued advocacy? Yeah, so we've already heard how important history is today. And it is, it's so important in, in this story. Um, and the history of Flint is this history of extremes, really kind of where greed met, met solidarity, where bigotry met fairness, and really where the struggle for equality has played out in, in the United States. The birthplace of General Motors brought the birthplace of labor contracts, which really made Flint this promised land and that great migration north for African Americans all over the world, or for immigrants all over the world. Um, people moved to Flint for, for prosperity, for opportunity, and most many people argue that that American dream, um, the middle class, was born in Flint. Um, but then General Motors, um, you know, driven by capitalism and greed, um, had a patent on tetraethyl lead, the use of lead in our gasoline. Um, and we hear so much about lead now, and we think that we, we you know, it wasn't a big deal back then. Um, and I'm going to tie in some other things that we talked about today but it was actually this amazing woman physician. Her name was Alice Hamilton. Who knows about Alice Hamilton? She's got Harvard roots. She was the very first woman professor at Harvard. Um, but at that time, she couldn't get tickets to the football game. She couldn't go in the faculty club, and she couldn't march in commencement. Um, but she persisted. So she was the nation's expert on occupational diseases in the 1920s. And she, and she was also, um, she got these social justice roots um, by living at the Hull House. So she lived at the Hull House in the early 1900s uh, with Jane Addams, and that's when uh, she treated immigrant children, and she had these well-child clinics, and she was seeing what, what, the, what industry was doing to, to people's health, and she really got into the, the world of occupational health. Um, so this was this amazing woman in the 1920s who recognized the evils of putting lead in gasoline and was sharing you know, to anybody who would listen that this is going to be a public health scourge, that we are are going to poison generations of children. Um, and what, what eventually prevailed was industry's upper hand and something called the keyhole paradigm, which really set a precedent in public health that harm must be proven before something is done. So it was all about show me the proof. And this is absolutely backwards. But this is really where we are today, especially with our, a lot of our environmental he health regulations. Um, so, th so the history is important because you know this is something I teach my students. This is, this is something my parents always taught me. Um, if we want to solve our complex problems moving forward, we have to start by looking back. And we do such a good job at closing our eyes to anything that's too dark or too complicated. Um, but we have to look at the past and look at history before we can ever move forward because we literally walk over darkness and complex history every single day. And you know, Dr. Mona, it wasn't only uh, General Motors who shut down Dr. Hamilton, right? It was also the federal government. Yes. Yep. The Surgeon General uh, sided with, at that time, sided with the auto industry and their, um, their rented white coats and their apologist scientists who were spreading fake science. And it took decades. It took decades to get lead out of gasoline. We were, as a nation, stubbornly slow to protect children. Um, if you just look at lead in water, we we've, um, didn't restrict the use of lead in our service lines till 1986, but not until 2014, just a few years ago, did we restrict the use of lead in our brass fixtures and faucets. Um, and to date, all of these regulations have not caught up with science and do not put public health and children's health um, at the foremost. And lead isn't only a persistent challenge in Flint. I mean, lead is a challenge in the water in parts of Cleveland, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and actually in thousands of communities across our country. Yeah, and it's not just the water. So, you know, when I heard about the possibility of lead in the water, any pediatrician would freak out because we know it's this irreversible neurotoxin. It impacts cognition and behavior and development. It's even been linked to things like criminality. Um, but the reason that I got so alarmed is because that we know it as a form of environmental racism. The burden of lead does not fall equally on our nation's children. Uh, it is kids in, in Flint and Detroit and Chicago and Philly and Baltimore, kids already burdened with so many of life's toxicities who are also burdened um, with, with elevated exposure. To lead. And yet, yeah, Dr. Mona, you're not just accepting the status quo. And I know you are um, kind of persistently, stubbornly optimistic, um, partly because of the kind of community of pediatricians and activists, journalists, advocates, parents you know, that you spoke about earlier who really raise the alarm about the crisis, but also who are doing everything they can not only to mitigate the impacts of lead, but to ensure that kind of children in Flint have every opportunity that any 
any parent would ever hope for any of our kids. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what you've done over the last few years and what you're doing now? Yeah, so I have this amazing privilege of waking up every day, working hand in hand with the people of Flint and so many other organizations to make sure that our children have the brightest future possible. Uh, so from the moment of recognition of this crisis, which was not just a lead crisis, we had um, Legionnaires disease, people died from a pneumonia, so there's homicide charges against folks, it's skin issues, but by and large, this was a, this was a trauma of trust. Uh, there was, people were betrayed by every governmental agency that was supposed to protect them. Uh, there's anger anger and fear and guilt and stress and um, anxiety and all these we know also lead to poor outcomes on top of really decades of crisis and neglect and and you know a history of kind of austerity and racism and discrimination that that already threatened the future of our children um, so we have taken this holistic approach and have thrown everything at our kids everything that science tells us will, will support children so Flint is this egregious story of kind of science denial science spoke truth to power and we are leaning on the incredible science of child development and brain plasticity and resilience to, to mitigate the impact of this crisis. So what we've been able to put in place is really a model, uh, things like brand new child care centers and home visiting programs and breastfeeding support and um, early literacy books and a lot of Chelsea's awesome books um, and school health services and Medicaid expansion, all these things that we know kids need. Um, but as a pediatrician, I'm not naive to think that that's enough to make a healthy family and a healthy community. We are working also upstream on the bigger issues like poverty mi mitigation and economic development and restorative justice and environmental justice and participatory democracy and self-determination, trying to make the city whole again in, in hand in hand in, in partnership. And the beauty of our work, and like I shared earlier, is that it's not an isolated story. There's kids all over that wake up to the same nightmares as my Flint kids. Um, with great irony, you know, Flint is birthplace of the American dream. As an, as an immigrant, I was a recipient of the American dream, but my kids in Flint literally wake up to nightmares as if that dream was never supposed to be for them, um, where zip codes play larger roles and trajectories than genetic codes. Um, so what we hope to do is very much shine a light on, on the circumstance of all children children, where kids all over this nation wake up to things like poverty and lost democracy and stolen opportunity um, and, and, and work on addressing all those issues. And you know, in our last few minutes, I do want to go back to talk a little bit more about democracy, because one of the things you know, that we've seen just even in the last um, few months since you've had a new governor in Michigan uh, is that the new governor has very much kind of taken it as her charge to try to have both real accountability and more kind of representative structures going forward, including in um, who is monitoring the environment, who is raising alarm bells, who is empowered and who is protected to be able to do that. And yet she has been stymied uh, at times, even stopped at times by the legislature. Could you just talk a little bit about kind of the current dynamics and kind of how in some ways Flint is being more well represented at the local and the state levels and in other ways there still is this ongoing kind of neglect and uh, disparagement. Yeah, so we have no more cities in Michigan under emergency management, uh, which was grossly undemocratic and unjust. The law is still on the book though, uh, but no other cities have lost clearly lost democracy. Um, the mayor has regained her powers, um, and the new governor has come in and really has been learning the lessons of Flint and, and trying to make an impact. Her very first executive order was a whistleblower protection order so that state employees who have any concerns should voice those concerns. She's also appointed two new positions um, in the state. One is an environmental justice advocate as well as a drinking water advocate, very much learning the lessons of Flint. And she's restructured our environmental department, which really kind of the, 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 the blame of this crisis really lies at their feet. Um, so she's trying to do what she can um, to address the situation to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Um, however, our legislature is one of the most gerrymandered legislatures in the state. Just yesterday, our federal court demanded redistricting. Um, so her efforts, um, it, it is difficult for her to accomplish things um, that, that she needs to be done if, if the legislature needs to be involved. So there's, there's still many folks who um, don't want to learn the lessons of Flint, don't want to strengthen public public health, health, health regulations, don't want to expand democracy, don't want to inc include multiple diverse voices at the table. So what else do you think needs to happen from your perspective, you know, as a pediatrician, you know, as a mom, um, kind of in, in Flint? So as a, 
as a professional, as a parent, as an advocate, you know, what do you think still needs to be done? Um, so I, I'm going to take this kind of um, beyond Flint. So, you know, like I, the title of my book is What the Eyes Don't See, and we've talked a lot about the, the invisibles. Um, so, it, you know, it's very much about people and places and problems we, we choose not to see, and people chose to choose to close their eyes to Flint. That was that city over there. That will never happen anywhere else. Just, like, literally close your eyes and look the other way and cover things up. Um, but that's not isolated to Flint. The, the, you know, there are injustices happening all over outside our, our, our front doors. And, and my message is that, we, you know, you don't have to come to Flint to make a difference. Just open your eyes. And it is not enough to be awake. Um, we have to act. We have to act no matter how scary it is, no matter how hard it is, no matter how impossible it may seem, no matter how many people might try to silence you, um, we have to act. And, and when we do it together, we are stronger. Um, the story of Flint is a, is a testament to the idea that people coming together, an unexpected ragtag, diverse group of people coming together can make a difference. So it is ultimately a story about, about all of us. It's, you know, it's not just a Flint story. It's about all of us. It's about who we are and who we want to be and, and what kind of place that we want to leave our children. And we all have a role to play no matter who we are and, and what we do. Um, I mentioned earlier that I do this work as a pediatrician because I literally took an oath to protect kids. I literally took an oath. Um, but very much implicit in this story, and I know, Chelsea, you get this so much, it's, 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 we all took an oath, no matter who we are. We all took an oath to open our eyes to injustices, to, to fight for our vulnerable kids, and to make sure that their trajectories are not bound by zip code, or state of birth, or color of skin, or country of origin, or drinking water source. Um, that really we can work towards a place where democracy and equality and opportunity are once again encouraged and advanced for all of our children. There should be no such thing. There should be no such thing as other people's kids. They're all my um, kids. My, my, my own biological children know that they have 6,000 siblings. <laughs> like, mom's not home today because she's with our other siblings. <laughs> um, well, thank your kids for uh, sharing you not only with uh, their 5,998 siblings in Flint, uh, but really with all of us. And just um, in our final minute, you know, Dr. Mona, though, if people here do want to help support your work in Flint, um, what should they do? Because I do want to give you a chance to say that explicitly because there are a lot of incredibly powerful and influential and creative and dynamic and innovative people in this room. So if they want to help Flint, what should they do? Sure, and we're grateful to so many folks who have been supported, including the Ford Foundation, who was there early on and, and helped really with the infrastructure and the capacity building. Um, so right after the crisis, we created the Flint Kids Fund, flintkids.org. It's our tomorrow fund. It's what's been funding our um, literacy programs and our breastfeeding support, and really to be able to do this work 20 years uh, down the road. So flintkids.org. So flintkids.org. So if you take only kind of three things, I guess, from today, please take... Um, the fact that Dr. Mona is incredibly heroic, but also recognizes that she's not alone and that we all need to do everything we can to support um, all of the Dr. Monas who help raise alarm bells and help protect our public health and hopefully prevent these crises from happening uh, in the first place. Two, that democracy always matters and those of us who aren't in a place shouldn't determine what that means. Uh, and three, flintkids.org. Um, so really, just thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Harvard. Uh, thank you, Visit and Justice. And thank you, Chelsea. Well, thank you, thank Dr. You. Mona. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you.